with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh, it's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Science Tonight. I am your host, Chris Smith. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, who's bringing you this show tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in on this first Science Tonight program of 2021. That's right. I haven't seen you folks uh, in several Thursdays, so I hope that you have started off your new year right. Things are, we'll say, hectic, crazy, weird out there in the world still. Uh, 2021 hasn't done us any favors in its first few days, has it? But we're here with the Science Museum, you and I and tonight's special guest to learn something new and get engaged in science. That's what we do at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and that's what we like to do with this program. Now, throughout the program tonight, throughout the show, I want to remind everybody that you have access to the chat box and the comments. So make sure that if you've got questions, comments that you want to ask our guest, type those up, post them there. Uh, my moderator is hanging out in the chat, ready to send those questions to us so that I can ask tonight's special guest for you. And we'll be doing audience Q&A a little bit later in the program after we hear a little from tonight's guest speaker. Now, for tonight, for the very first show of 2021, I am very excited about tonight's topic because I don't think we could start a year of Science Tonight shows with any other topic than this one, dinosaurs, right? Because who doesn't love dinosaurs? When we do programs at the museum, there are two topics that bring out everybody. We can do space, everybody loves to talk about space. And the second one, in no particular order, is dinosaurs. And of course, if you walk around the Museum of Natural Sciences, there are no shortage of dinosaurs. And we're very fortunate at our museum, we have no shortage of paleontologists. Tonight's guest is one of the paleontologists that you could see working inside the museum day to day, when we're working inside the museum, of course. And he's a PhD student at North Carolina State University. Everybody put your hands together and welcome Haviv Avrahami. Haviv, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. How have you been? I haven't actually seen you in person in months now. Yeah, I know, right? It's, uh, it's unfortunate. I've been great, yeah. Uh, had a nice holiday, you know, despite everything that's going on in the world, but uh, it's been nice. So nice weather. It has, it has. It's been nice to get outside, yeah. uh, even in the cold now these days. Mm -hmm, for sure. So, Haviv, before we jump into your science, the work that you're doing every day uh, with NC State, your dissertation that you're diving into now, as I understand it, before we really get into the, the hard science of stuff, um, knowing that you're a dinosaur expert, I thought it would be fun to prepare a few trivia questions to ascertain just the level of expertise that you really have. All right, right on. Let's do it. <laughs> you're, are, you, are you up for this? Okay. Totally. I'm going I'm going to share my screen because uh, I think these are hard questions about dinosaurs and it might help to give folks some context. Now, when I say dinosaurs, Haviv, what I mean is the 1991 sitcom on ABC, Dinosaurs. Ah, I remember. So I've prepared three trivia questions to test your expertise, yeah, on, on dinosaurs. Are you ready? Yeah, here's the first one. And I encourage, hey, everybody watching online, you can type your answers to these questions into the <laughs> chat box as we go along. So Haviv, you've, you've had a chance to see this one now. Here's your first question. Many of the dinosaurs' names on the sitcom were familiar to viewers, such as Sinclair, Hess, and Phillips. What were they named after? Is it A, oil companies, B, TV executives, or C, US politicians? Yeah, I actually know this because we fill up at one of these stations every year when we go out to the field. It's, uh, it's A, oil companies. A, oil companies. Round of applause. That is the correct answer. Oh, okay. That's cool. So you hit uh, Sinclair, Hess, or Phillips? We, we hit a Sinclair, I think. It's a, it, that's the one with the uh, Brontosaurus, right? I believe. Exactly. Yeah, yes. So. 
That's how Perfect. we drive through Utah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there you go. Personal experience with that one. Okay, here's your second trivia question. What species of dinosaur is Earl Sinclair, the family patriarch? Is he a Wisaysadon, a Megalosaurus, or a Tyrannosaur? I included a hopefully helpful photo of Earl. Yeah, I, I'm going to guess here based on the anatomy, which I, I hope is an accurate representation, but because I see three <laughs> claws, I'm going to go with Megalosaurus. Oh, okay, yes. Really? Megalosaurus is the correct answer. Wow, well, right on. <laughs> see, look at the OC. Oh, two out of three, you've basically won the trivia game at this point. Yeah, I threw Tyrannosaur in there because I thought, I don't know, bipedal, upright, carnivore looking. Maybe that would throw them off. And We Say So was the company that Earl works for in the show. Oh, uh, yeah. I <laughs> thought maybe I could trip you up with if you were like really new to the show. Okay. One more. And it looks like people in the chat did pretty well with this one too. Oh, they're saying they're too easy. Okay, well here, let's try this one. Okay. Next question. <laughs> the series finale, last episode, which of the following happened? How did the series end? A missile launch deflects a massive meteor. Corporations cause the end of the world or dinosaurs watch breaking news on TV of a meteor impact. Uh. Let's go with the most realistic one, B. The mo <laughs> so, so you're saying that on a series finale for a TV sitcom about dinosaurs, they would end it by having a corporate uh, corporation destroy the planet. Oh, you, man, uh, I don't know. This is a tough chat one. Say, what we've got people in the chat say that it's uh they're going between b and c yeah can i phone a friend i don't know uh let's just stick with b i already won two so that's the correct answer oh, boom this the series finale they sit down to watch tv a corporation has uh has demolished a landscape that has led to large ecosystem collapse and they end it by wishing everyone on the planet goodbye. It's all too real. What a way to go out, right? Yeah, no kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, I think it would have been too, too real to life to actually end a show about dinosaurs with, with a meteor. Like, mm -hmm. that's just too easy. Totally. <laughs> And, and the show was supposedly set 60 million uh, in the year 60 million, which I think in the timeline, I don't know if that would have worked out anyway. So about 5 million years too short. So oh, just a little bit too short, <laughs> just too short. Well, okay. You make it into the Science Tonight Hall of Fame. Three correct answers. Nice job. Right on. Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky guesses. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and everybody in the chat, nice job. You got it done too. Oh, Kai Button remembers that the oh, show. Oh, Kai. Kai's there. Cool. Kai's here walking. All right. So uh, let's, let's get down to business now. Let's actually get down to business. I mean, you've basically won the program already. Everybody loves you. So <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about some real dinosaurs at this point. Aviv, uh, let's get to it. Break down your science for us. What is it you're working on? What are you studying? What are you doing at NC State? Cool. All right, right on. Well, can I share some slides with you all? Yeah, <laughs> let's take a look. All right, so I'll introduce you to what I'm working on. Uh, let's see if I can pull that up here. Pictures are always good. Can you meeting. see this? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's go over this. All right. So this is my intro slide. Okay. And it's just basically has the title of my dissertation project. Right. Um, and it's pretty complicated. It's pretty noisy. Uh, and later on we can go through maybe, and I'll pick apart each one of these different things. But the main thing I want to focus on here is that I am describing and working on a new species of an orodromy dinosaur. 
Uh, and so I'll, I'll introduce you to what orodromines are right now. Um, all right. So uh, orodromines are a group of plant-eating dinosaurs. Uh, they were pretty small for dinosaurs. They typically range in size from like a dog to a horse, as you can see here. And we know of about six of them. Uh, I'm working on the one at the bottom in blue, number six. Uh, this was the one from Utah and it doesn't have a name yet. So yeah, we know there's six of them. There might be eight, uh, but I can get into that a little bit later, but we know that there's for sure six. And they, these dinosaurs were from the Cretaceous period and they, were, they mostly lived in North America, but there's uh, one species that lived in South, uh, South Korea. And the other two that I mentioned that might be orodromines are from China and Mongolia. <clears throat> so uh, basically, what are some basic things about these dinosaurs? Like I said, they're small, they're plant eaters, uh, and um, they walked on two legs, that's important. <clears throat> and they had a mouth, um, a jaw, jaws full of teeth, but they also had beaks. And there's some other things, but I'll get into those. But uh, I just want to show you where they where they exist on the family tree of dinosaurs. So this is a pretty basic uh, phylogeny of dinosaur relationships. And you have your more familiar ones that you guys know on the left here. The, the ones on the left, these are your theropod meat eaters like Tyrannosaurus and Velociraptor and obviously your birds, right? All birds are dinosaurs. <clears throat> And then a little bit further up the tree, you get your sauropod plant eaters. Those were the big ones, the biggest dinosaurs ever with the long necks. But here on the right side of the tree, this is where we get all our plant eaters, our triceratops and our stegosaurs, our ankylosaurs, our pachys. And uh, so where orodromines exist on this tree is right around here. Uh, and just to, just to say this real quick, orodromines are in a more broad group of dinosaurs that look like them called neo-ornithischians, which basically means primitive, uh, primitive ornithischians. They retained a primitive body plan. So each of these crazy looking dinosaurs that we see, right? The triceratops with the horns, ankies, which are like tanks, stegosaurs, all these crazy uh, morphological patterns that we see in these derived plant eating dinosaurs, they all evolved from something. And they evolved from a group of dinosaurs that looked like or orodromians. <clears throat> um, and so this is kind of what those neo-ornithischians looked like. Okay, they're definitely pretty crazy, huh? Um, and I, I'll, I can talk more a little bit later about like the cool things about their feathers, uh, because you can see here that they have these weird uh, barbules and feathers. Um, actually, I'll talk about that now. <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, I was gonna I was about to jump in and just ask about some of these because these like miniature murder chickens. Oh, I know. Huh? <laughs> are too exciting. Totally. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'll talk about their feathers a little bit here right now. Um, so they're kind of more like proto feathers, right? They're the, the feathers we see in modern birds are really complicated and they're really specialized. They're flight feathers, right? So they have a barb and they have multiple complex branching patterns. They're pretty stiff a lot of the times. But baby birds have these, these fluffier kind of um, dino fuzz, right? It's more like dino fuzz and uh, they're simpler structures. And that's what we would have seen in these neo-ornithischians because they hadn't evolved the complex flight feathers. So I think they would have been great. I think they would have been great pets. Um, I think they would have been uh, wonderfully fluffy and fun to play with. Uh, so. Wait, hold on, I'm gonna write that down. Uh, okay. <laughs> neo-ornithischians were great pets. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna come back to that. I like it. <laughs> so yeah, so that's basically the brief introduction on these guys. Um, there's some other things, right? I mean, this is a pretty noisy figure um, that that shows a bunch of stuff and, on the left, right? And what I I guess the left is mainly supposed to show you how many uh, basal ornithischians or neo ornithischians there are. So. Um, it's, we, ha we have a lot of dinosaurs, but we still need a lot more. There's still a lot, a, a lot of gaps in this record. Um, but the, it's the three images on the right that are important. Um, because the, what the three images on the right show is that we still have really no idea how these interrelationships actually are. Or basically what I'm trying to say is the topology or the structure um, 
of these relationships, they switch, they switch around a lot between different studies, right? You can see here that from 2007 to 2015, just these three studies have wildly different organizations. They, um, and so this is kind of one of the things I'm working on. And we might be able to go into that a little bit later about how this actually is done methodologically um, without getting into the crazy math of it. But uh, yeah, this is basically something I'm trying to do. And it's incredibly important for how we um, understand dinosaurs. If we don't understand their interrelationships, it's really hard for us to make inferences on overall diversity patterns throughout the Mesozoic and uh, the processes of evolution. So this this is uh, this uh, uh, part of it, whatever. The, the, Doing these interrelationships and making sure we, we can find them out uh, accurately and reliably is critical for that kind of uh, uh, advancing. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Okay. So, so the, the charts that we're seeing here on the right side, these are like timelines of evolution who came first, who came next? Basically, and so yeah. If figuring out how they're all related to each other uh, in, in this grand timeline tells you a lot about how dinosaurs evolve generally. Is this, is this right? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, or, or how these specific groups evolve. Yeah, it, it does tell you a little bit about how they evolve, but, but what it's really is, what we call these are phylogenies. And the ones on the right are, are extremely simplified. I, I, I simplified them just to show, sure, to really yeah. highlight how the major groups are shifting around. But even within these groups, you have dinosaur, you have sometimes between different studies plopping in and out, um, depending on how the math was done or how, how the character scorings were done. Yeah, so uh, the important part of doing this is that it just shows, it's, it's just, it's aimed at figuring out how dinosaurs are related to each other and which ones are closer, more closely related and, and more distantly related. I guess, I, guess, I hope that makes sense. So. I think I got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and so, so your work then is putting together one of these puzzles or trying to figure out which of these puzzles is the right one. Is that, yeah. an, is that a very simplistic way of thinking about what you're doing? Um, yeah, basically, let me go to a different slide for you so I can explain this a little bit more. Cause what I'm doing, what the part that I'm doing here is just one of four parts of my project of my overall project is doing these interrelationship things. But uh, uh, if, if we look right here, this is kind of how we determine these relationships, okay? So one thing we really need to understand is that dinosaurs are data, right? I mean, obviously they're cool, but they're not just for, you know, throwing up into a Jurassic Park movie and stuff, right? Like they're actually data, they're, their bodies are data. Um, and so what we can do basically is we can go across these skeletal elements, the ones that we see on the left here, right? These are these are six uh, jaw bones of neo-ornithischians. Um, and <clears throat> they all look slightly different. And these little data points that we, we have right here, right? We can code these into a statistical analysis as a series of ones or zeros or twos and things like that, multi-state variables. <clears throat> and then we can create huge spreadsheets. So the one that I'm working on right now has about 300 characters and it's including about 40, 50 different taxa or 40, 50 different animals. And that's, we build these matrices and then matrices, and then we throw them through a statistical software, which basically does, does a bunch of probability math equations to determine relationships. But th this is highly dependent on, on how, you, how you characterize things. So um, like, the kinds of qu the quality of the character scores that you take, I guess, if that makes sense, and also the number of taxa you have in there. Um, so there, there are reasons why the resolute, like what different studies are getting, is so um, variable. Um, and I mean, I could spend hours talking about that, but that's just getting through into the weeds of it. So, <laughs> so yeah. no, but it makes a lot of sense, right? You you look at the inform you look at the dinosaur fossils. And then, sure, you run them through the spreadsheets and the statistical analysis, but all of that is to try to help you get at what's the same and what's different and how different are they? Yeah. And then you can put together these the phylogenies, the, these evolutionary timelines, uh, and that tells you about neo-ornithitians, neo mm -hmm. if, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm hearing you right. 
it tells you how those neat like which of those neoornithischians were how, what their actual biologically real like relationships were i guess if that makes sense right i mean i i'm trying to think of a, a good analogy but um yeah i mean it it just show, helps us figure out which ones were cousins, which ones were sisters, which ones were, were the fathers, the moms. Yeah, like things like that, right? It helps us understand the family tree. And we need to know a real fam like we need to know a realistic family tree before we can really make uh, other inferences and claims about what's going on with these dinosaurs. Or to be able to, to, to ask other questions and things. Yeah, we, we need a reliable phylogeny, so. So you said this is about a quarter of your project. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the dinosaurs that you're working on. Like we were looking at some of the the artwork earlier, uh, but yeah. maybe we can dive in a little bit about some of those species and what's interesting about them. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. I can. I can uh, walk you through some of the stuff that I'm doing specifically with my dissertation. Um, where is that slide? Okay, so I guess I could do this. I could break apart like the, the, the part of my dissertation, um, like each, each of these topics, right? Um, so what I'm doing specifically is, like I said, we, we found a new orodromine, so the, a six orodromine from a, uh, an area in Utah. And I'll go to that slide first. I'll describe where it is in Utah, right? So we found these dinosaurs in a place called the Muss and Touch It member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. So basically the Muss and Touch It member is this little sliver of time. Um, well, well, the Cenomanian, the, it's from the Cenomanian. So the Cenomanian is, in, is an age within the Cretaceous. Uh, and the Muss and Touch It is about 96 to 94 million years old. And you can see it kind of highlighted here. This is what the world looked like at the time. <clears throat> but the Muss and Touch It, it represented this fluvial, uh, uh, region. It was this floodplain environment with lots of rivers and it was super muddy and it was on the coast of this intercontinental seaway. So at this time in the Cretaceous, there was a big seaway that split the country in two. And so in Utah, even though it's a desert now, back then it was the uh, coast of this floodplain. <clears throat> and uh, it looked something like this. So this is the ecosystem that uh, our new orodromines probably lived in, right? It, it looked, probably looked like something like this. So what I'm doing is I am describing the ostology, histology, ontogeny, and phylogeny. And I already talked a little bit about what the phylogeny is and how that work uh, goes. But <clears throat> uh, the ostology, what this word basically means is that I'm gonna be studying the outside of the bones. So I'm describing the anatomy on the outside. Uh, and you can kind of see how that looks right here or in this slide right here, which is uh, part of what I'm working on for this next paper, <clears throat> is uh, it's just a big manuscript of des describing their anatomy and their different features. So that's what oste osteology is. Uh, the histology, which is the second part, that's looking at the inside of the bones. So it's looking at certain textures and structural features. And this is really important for answering a number of questions related to their growth. <clears throat> so you can see this here. This is what we do. We cut up the bones and we, we polish them down really, really thin to, until they're like paper thin and we can run a light microscope through them. And you can get these really beautiful images where you can count up their lines of arrested growth. Basically they have these annual uh, growth lines kind of like tree rings. And that way we can determine how old they are. Uh, and I've done some other stuff here we can talk about later with uh, if we get into the burrowing stuff, but uh, that I've done with histology. But yeah, that's that's what this part of, uh, of it is. And so we can we can I, I was able to do this to figure out which ones were maybe teens and adults and which ones were juveniles. Right. Because we dug we dug up a orodromine or several orodromines from one locality that we call the mini troll locality but we found multiple individuals here right and at first we didn't know if they were the same animal or different species we found a smaller femur and then we found a larger femur and they could have been from the same animal or not so to really determine that we had to figure out what their age was so i cut up the bones and i counted the growth rings and what obviously the one on the right you can see is smaller, but it also doesn't have any lines of arrested growth, which means it's less than a year old. 
Um, and the ones on the left have four, four, five, or six lines of arrested growth. So they're about four, four to six years old. But, you know, if the one on the right had seven growth lines, then it would probably be a different species because it's seven years old, but it's that a smaller size. So that's some of the things we can do with histology, right? Um, and, and that really gets into what the third thing is, which is the ontogeny, which is studying the growth of the animal over its lifetime. And you really need to use the data that you get from the osteology and the histology to uh, look at patterns in growth across their lifetime, right? That's, that's kind of what I'm doing for ontogeny is, is understanding how the body changes. So some questions I can ask there, right, are how is there, at what point do they reach sexual maturity or what point are uh, their bones becoming uh, strong enough or robust enough to facilitate independent digging, right? Maybe that indicates when they're moving out of their parents' burrows if they're burrowing and things like that. So that's that's some of the things we can do there. Yeah, so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, really interesting stuff. So, so you were actually out in the field and you found... Uh, and you found some of these dinosaurs. Now, was this like the the paleo team from the museum found specimens and you were able to start working on them or did you actually find these? Yeah, no. So I, we all kind of find stuff when we go out there. Um, uh, the one that, this this one, the mini troll locality was found by Lisa Herzog. If you guys know her, she, uh, uh, you know, she's one of my bosses in the paleo lab and she found mini troll. Uh, Lindsay found a different one, Karmic, and she found um, a, another locality, uh, Last Chance, I think. <clears throat> and then we're also working with the Field Museum uh, in, Ute uh, in Chicago, because um, they found a few too. Uh, I discovered uh, a plant eater, but it's not an orodromian. It's a little bit more derived. It's uh, like an iguanodontian, so that's also in the lab, but uh, it's a it's, uh, yeah, it's more it's more advanced, I guess, phylogenetically than the orodromians. So, okay, all right. I just you know I, I look at like the analysis that you're doing here, and having been around the museum now for just a few years, I see a lot of the kind of research that goes on in the paleontology lab too, and I'm always amazed that it's not just digging up fossils. Mm -hmm there is so much more that goes into paleontology research, like what you're doing here with the, all of the ogenies and the ologies <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that you're employing, uh, you know, and this is for, for a PhD dissertation, you know, compared to, in addition to, not compared to, in addition to the work that goes on inside the research lab and it in paleo labs all over, like, there's so many different sciences that all come together uh, oh, to yeah. tell us about what, what ancient life was like, which, okay. which leads me to my, my next question is that you were mentioning the burrowing dinosaurs and you had the, the graphic there. And so how does the information that you're pulling together lead you to this idea that dinosaurs weren't just stalking the land, they were also stalking the under, <laughs> underground? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let's talk about the burrowing thing, because that's a pretty interesting topic. <clears throat> and it's kind of part of my dissertation, but it's not like a major component. Mm -hmm. um, so I will once again share some slides with you. <clears throat> um, so. Oh, yeah, here's, here's just a cool little video of what they might have been like running around. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but okay, so th so these weren't like big dinosaurs. They were yeah. what, like modern day deer? Yeah, size? they were kind of deer size, dog size, maybe maybe up to horse size. But they were they were small for dinosaurs. You know, they were they were on the lower end of uh, dinosaur sizes for sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, so let's get into the burrowing thing. Okay, so I talked about how there have been other orodromians that have been discovered in the past. There's one specific orodromine that was discovered from a, a, uh, a location that is close to our guys. So it's at the same time period, but it's in Montana and Idaho rather than in Utah. And this area in Montana and, uh, Montana and Idaho was more arid and it was less wet and it was more dry than the area um, from Utah. But the dinosaur from 
that area is called Arictodromius. And what's really crazy is that these dinosaurs were found inside a burrow. So you can see here, I hope you can see my crosshair, um, but uh, uh, Arictodromius bones were found inside of the burrow. And since then, additional burrows have been found in this area, but they don't, they haven't been found as far as I know with, um, with additional skeletons. Uh, but the real question here is, were they actually digging these burrows, right? Were they digging them or were they just found in them? Um, were their bones maybe scavenged or uh, the product of prey, uh, like prey scavenging in them? Or maybe, you know, what, one, thing, one thing we see a lot in, common, in modern animals is that they hijack the burrows of other animals. So it could just be that they, they are living in them, but they're not actually digging in them. It could be that the bones were washed in the, into the burrow during a flood event, something like that. Um, so there's been a lot of work on trying to look and see if there's additional evidence to support burrowing behavior in these Orictodromius dinosaurs. Um, and and by, an ex, by extension, the mustn't touch it Orodromia, the new Orodromia that we have, which is closely related. Um, so what's what the evidence then? So the evidence for the Orictodromius is mm -hmm. it was found in something that was very obviously a burrow. Yeah. And there's additional evidence too. Well, additional additional support. So let's go over some of those, okay. right? And, and that's right here. And there's a lot going on here. So I'll, I'll try to break it down. But basically one through four are features on the bones that support uh, the idea that they could be burrowing, right? So let's look at number one first, which is in green, and that's the humerus. That's that's this bone right here. And in these orodromines, it's larger. It's uh, it's larger relative to other ornithopods, and that's an important bone in modern animals for digging, uh, as well as the shoulder bone, the scapula, which is in purple. Uh, in orodromines, it's enlarged, and there's aspects of it that are wider, like the spine. <clears throat> so, and it's it's thought that it could potentially um, uh, provide mechanical advantages to the musculature that's important for a burrowing action, right? Because that's a really stressful action. Number three, if we look at the snout, these animals have a fused premaxilla. So basically their two, their two front snout bones have been fused together and they're extra hard. And that's similar to something we see in a lot of head first burrowers in modern animals, um, especially like crocodiles, they use their snout. There is a Chinese crocodile that uses its mouth to construct burrows, uh, I believe up to 50, 50 meters in length. Um, and so oh, wow. and it's just a simple YouTube uh, search will, will show a bunch of crocodiles and burrows, right? So <clears throat> it's possible that they were employ employing a similar mechanism. Uh, another thing with, with, uh, with, it, with the morphology of the skeleton, number four, right, their hips, their hips were reinforced, right? Because you can imagine that if something is digging, it needs to, it needs to plant itself. It, need, it needs to support itself on the ground or across the walls of a tunnel to be able to uh, stay in place while it's doing that scratch digging motion. And then number five is a certain mus muscles that have been uh, inferred. There's been some studies that have looked at to see if there are muscle attachment areas that, su that support a burrowing, uh, burrowing behavior. And some have alluded to their being support, while others, um, other areas of the of the musculature and the and the ulna or this bone right here, um, do not necessarily show adaptations that would support burrowing. So there's some back and forth there. One thing that I did, and this is really cool. So let's focus now on six. <clears throat> All right. So six <clears throat> is something I did, and I'm writing up right now, <laughs> and it's related to the histology, uh, the histology work that I did. So uh, let's go to this slide, which is right here. This bone texture is crazy. So this bone texture is called CCCB. That's shorthand for compacted coarse cancellous bone, but let's just stick with CCCB. And uh, this bone texture is crazy chaotic. I mean, it's just like, uh, these animals were, these, the bones were just like, we need to grow as fast as possible, just do it in a disorganized way, go crazy, right? And so it's convoluted, it's randomly organized, and it's suggested that this bone texture possibly provides a mechanical advantage towards the stress and strain and loading of burrowing behavior or of 
repetitive movements on limbs. And so mo in modern animals, we also see this in burrowing animals, but also in animals that fly or that swim, that do that re repetitive motion, also in graviportal animals or, or animals that are really heavy like elephants. But yeah, so you can see here that it's been found in, in groundhogs and in armadillos and aardvarks. Um, and, and likewise, we found it in the orodromine um, in limited proportions. But we gotta be careful with what kind of statements we say here because we can't just be like, oh, look, we found it, therefore it's burrowing, right? I mean, that's not really how science works. So it, it adds support possibly for a hypothesis, but you really need to do a lot more statistical work and phylogenetic comparative work um, to basically uh, say, make these um, statements confidently. So, um, but it's still pretty cool that we found it there. It's a good observation and it's part of the journey towards uh, figuring out what's actually going on with these animals. So, um, and then, yeah. And then I can talk about the seventh thing. So one crazy thing is when we find these dinosaurs out in Utah, we find them in these like weird pancakes, right? Like, I mean, they're smushed together and like, like they've been thrown through a blender and then they're, they're in these compacted little bundles, which could possibly suggest that they are being preserved in, uh, in burrows. Um, this is what it looked like, the block. Uh, you used to be able to see this in the lab through the window, um, but it's all been prepared out now. <clears throat> um, but what's really cool is that I ran this thing through a CT scanner before it was prepared. And, and this is what we got. So I had, I had my undergrad uh, segment out all these bones here. Harrison Miller, and he uh, and he helped me segment out all these little bones, and then um, <clears throat> and then we color coded them, right? And so you can see that whatever happened uh, after this animal died, it its bones moved around and jumbled up a bit, right? So there was definitely some transport, but that can happen inside of a burrow. Um, there's been some studies that have shown that even in a burrow, when mud or, or flooding events happen and they kind of drown a burrow that it can jumble up the bones. So it's possible, right? It's possible, but, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's that. Oh, okay. And then this is, some, this <laughs> I was is something- look, I was looking what? at that and <laughs> I was looking at that image there and I was thinking, wow, I, I've seen a lot of Instagram posts of people who have just loved doing puzzles uh -huh. during the pandemic. And my goodness, we should have just got some of these puzzlers <laughs> to help. <laughs> to help you put these dinosaurs back together. Yeah, totally. And, and, and so there's just one other thing I want to say about support against possible hypothesis for burrowing, just so I can cover mm. all the bases, right? Because these animals, these new ornithischians and these orodromians have something that's really weird, right? They have this really weird structure on their tails. It's called an ossified tendon network. And basically what this is, is it's just a series of, of, tendons that have be tur been turned into bones, but it's a scaffolding network that goes sometimes all the way down the tail. And it's thought that this structure possibly uh, was used to provide tail, like to uh, make the tail super rigid, right? So it would have been super rigid and non-bendable. <clears throat> and you can imagine that this would limit the burrow, the, the mobility of a animal inside of a tight burrow, right? If, they're, if they go in one way, they can't really turn around if their tail is like a horn or is like really stiff. But there still needs to be more work done uh, on, on how this ossified tendon network actually manifests in like the mechanical behavior of the animal because we still don't exactly know. And what's also weird is that some orodromians have it and others don't. So um, it's kind of weird. <clears throat> yeah, what do, you, what do you do with that in that case? <clears throat> Well, what, what does that tell you if you're looking at all these different, you assume, I guess, different species or, you know, different species and each one does or doesn't have some of these features, but you're trying to, you're trying to piece them together and like build these relationships between them. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, specifically to the ossified tendon network, uh, there, there's definitely a lot more work that needs to be done. I think one important thing to do first is constrain the ages of all the animals or there's a, there's like you remember that that phylogeny from earlier <clears throat> that sure. showed all those all those new ornithischians, but you you'd be surprised because so few of them have been uh, so so few of them have received histological analysis, so we don't actually know the ages of them, right? And so it could be that the ossified tendon network is uh, is variable throughout the lifetime, 
um, and it could just be that it's also a homo homoplacious uh, character. So that's something that's basically like a convergent evolution, right? I mean, sometimes you can, you can, you can have animals evolving the same feature um, independent of each other, right? Mm -hmm. So it could just be that there this is a character trait that uh, is is variable and it's just sometimes they're they're evolved and sometimes it's it's reduced uh, or it's not present right so so you're putting together a lot of the pieces i mean uh you know i joked that just putting together the, this one little group of dinosaurs is, is quite the puzzle but the puzzle is even bigger than that oh yeah like like you you do the the puzzle of the the bones and then you've got the puzzle of how that that set of fossils fits into the broad, the whole scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what for you makes doing paleontology research like this, the most exciting or the most interesting? What's the most interesting? What's my, what's my favorite part of the job? Yeah. What's because there's, I mean, like I said before, there's so much that's going into this. Like what is the part that makes you ready to get up every day and do some more paleontology? Two things. Hmm. two things um the first one is is when i'm in the field that's the first thing that i really love about the job that makes me live for it uh <clears throat> there's really nothing quite like exploring the desert alone for two days wandering the wilderness searching for dinosaur bones um there's yeah like that's like the best part i mean you're literally removing the ground away and uncovering the bones of scientifically accurate dragons, right? I mean, that's just wonderful. <clears throat> but the second thing that I really love about, about being a paleontologist and just being a scientist is that moment. Uh, you can imagine if I'm in the lab late at night, right? And I'm looking at my bones and I'm studying them and comparing them to the bones of other animals that they're closely related to. There's that moment that you see something and you're just like, hmm, that's odd. And, and that's the moment that I really live for, right? That unpredictable moment. It's not just with when you're looking at the bones, but you could have a project where you're running a statistical analysis and you get your data back and you're just like, hmm, I didn't expect that, right? Or you're looking at the histology slides under the, under the microscope and you see something that you didn't expect. It's that, hmm, that's odd moment that I, uh, I really love, so. And it sounds like uh, in paleontology, there's lots of opportunity to have those moments. Yeah. Everything is new all the time. For sure. Definitely. So, okay. Uh, in two more minutes, I'm going to start grabbing questions from the chat box. So folks watching, we got a great crowd. It looks like watching. Drop your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat. I'm going to grab those in just a moment. Um, but you mentioned earlier, and I said I would come back to it, about these orodromines being good pets. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking like an animal the size of like a, maybe a large dog size would be okay, but mm -hmm. something like deer or person size. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm backing away from at this point. Uh, you'd have to convince me. I, I think they would be, I mean, when we talk about what would be a good dinosaur pet, I think they mm -hmm. rank among the higher levels of, of being a good pet, right? Because any other dinosaur is either gonna eat you or stomp on you. At least these guys are small <laughs> enough that they that they won't do it. So I think they would be good like backyard pets, like a husky, right? Uh, they like to dig around a lot too. So they're going to tear up your yard. Um, so yeah, for sure. But uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe just that they're, they're kind of sort of fluffy is, yeah. is fun. Yeah. And they might be nice if you can domesticate them over, you know, 9,000 years or something like we did with chickens i don't know so right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're entering the realm of speculation which is something i do a lot when i'm in the shower but uh, uh <laughs> I, I think right. they i think they would be nice if you could domesticate them so i mean they're, they're plant eaters right so they wouldn't necessarily be a, aggressive yeah at least they wouldn't want to eat you yeah they might nip like, at you and i mean the pets that we have now cats and dogs are, are carnivores and, yeah. and they do fine yeah yeah so okay maybe an orgermine orgermine would uh, would work out okay Consider they would definitely they, yeah. <laughs> they would definitely look cool on your instagram for sure oh yeah totally. all, all kinds of pet instagrams for dinosaurs totally <laughs>
And what, well, you know what, actually, that is a good question. So if you were going to have a pet dinosaur, you're thinking one of these would be great. Does that mean that these are your favorite dinosaurs? Um, they are only my favorite dinosaur out of default because I love them and because I'm working on them, right? But uh, these dinosaurs are paying the bills. <clears throat> they're obviously my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I'm working on them. But I guess growing up, I had a different favorite dinosaur. Mm. Uh, and this is, this is my favorite dinosaur uh, after Ordromians, I guess I could say which are all birds, right? All birds are dinosaurs, so. And I have this weird uh, lifelong obsession of finding wild animals and uh, raising them back to health. Uh, although the one in the middle I didn't find, I just, I, I met that emu at uh, a sanctuary in Australia and we, uh, we became best friends. But the other three, <laughs> I, I raised back to health. So I, I really like birds and. Uh, oh, fascinating. Yeah. Those are gorgeous. And you and you brought those back to, back to health. Yeah, the uh, the one on the right I found drowning in some water, so I saved mm -hmm. her and, and and fed her back. And then the top left I actually kept him for a few weeks. Uh, that was Spartacus. Uh, he was being surrounded by a bunch of cats, and so I uh, picked him up and fed him some cat food, and then released him once he got old enough to fly. <clears throat> oh wow, very cool. That is yeah. that's a brilliant answer to the what is your favorite dinosaur question. <laughs> so let me turn to the chat box now. Let's see what people are talking about. Right um, I think Kai had the first question that I saw. And let's see, Kai says, wants to know if you wanted to tell us what sounds like a very interesting story of when you discovered one of these dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to, he wrote it, so I'm going to say it, when you almost peed on it. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah, so. <laughs> this sounds like uh, a great story. So I got lucky my first year out. Um, I was, uh, it was my first year. So I've been doing field work for eight years now. Uh, coming up, it'll be my eighth year. Um, my first year out, which was before I started my undergraduate career, uh, I, vol I, I took a class. Um, through Lindsay's field program, and we went to Utah. And the first day out there, I was uh, I was we're talking, prospecting. We're, we're talking about uh, Dr. Lindsay Zano. Yeah, the, Lindsay Zano. Yeah, the top we paleontologist went, at the museum. Yeah, my boss. Yeah, <clears throat> my current boss. Yeah, but back then, she uh, she was my teacher officially, in, uh, like for this class. <clears throat> we went out to Utah, and um, and I was prospecting the first day, just walking around the hills. Uh, and, uh, I didn't find anything all day. And then I went down to an area which I wasn't really planning to go to, which was cradled bet between a bunch of big sandstone blocks, obviously for privacy, because I had to do what I had to do. Uh, and then, uh, and then lo and behold, as I was looking around, I saw all these vertebrae backbones. Uh, and, um, from there, uh, it was just a plethora of a full skeleton of a new plant eating dinosaur that we, we still, we, you know, we have in the, in the museum now. So the that thrill was pretty of discovery. Crazy. Yeah, that was wild. Right. I mean, it was fun. So it's always fun to find something new. So there you go. And natural body functions can wait when science is on. the oh, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's, let's see. Earl is asking, could the burrows of the orodramine species be only for raising young? You know, that's a good point. And- uh, Kind of like a nest? Yeah, that, I thought about them as nesters for quite some time, um, thinking about that. So I, I think it is possible <clears throat> that it's like a specific nest building behavior. Uh, there's lots of birds in Indonesia that, uh, the, uh, that build burrows specifically for uh, nesting and things like that. And so it's possible, but we just don't, we don't have evidence to say one way or the other yet at this point, <clears throat> whether or not they were specifically for nesting or whether they were actually living in them like at night or seeking refuge or constructing them often. Um, we don't know if they were obligate or facultative burrowers or yeah, so. Excellent. 
Um, here's another one. How often are new dinosaurs found? Uh, right now, uh, very, very fast. So this is a this is the time in our history of paleontology where the most amount of dinosaur dinosaur discoveries are being made. <laughs> I can't. I don't remember the exact number right now, but um, every year is like a little bit more than last year. So. So this is, they, some people say this is the golden age of paleontology and uh, it's wonderful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really good time to, to be a paleontologist then. Yeah. This is the time to sign up. So <laughs> there you go, everybody. Well, okay. So that's a great question. If somebody wanted to sign up to be a paleontologist, how does a person get started? What does somebody do to become a researcher like you? Um. I mean, that's kind of complicated. I mean, I had my own really, really un, uh, unconventional way towards becoming a paleontologist, uh, which I, I can okay. talk about if somebody wants to, but um, I mean, I Yeah, don't know. how did you get into it? <clears throat> yeah, so we got some time here. Let me- uh, We got some time, yeah. Let me share my screen with you again, and I will uh, show you a doozy of a slide. It's quite embarrassing, so. Um, but I think it's important. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I all, like most kids, I always liked science. I was always very curious at a young age. I think most kids are, I think most humans are, right? We're, inna when we're, we're innately curious about our natural world. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, in middle school, I was a good kid, but started having some problems at home, uh, you know, I won't get into specifics, but, you know, I, uh, no dad around, but I love science. <clears throat> but I, you know, mm -hmm. as I was transitioning from middle school to high school, I started becoming quite the troublemaker. And I was quite rebellious and I, uh, I didn't like school. So, yeah. So once I got into high school between within my high school years, I, uh, I only made D's and F's in school. Uh, I got suspended 21 times. Uh, so obviously I wasn't able to graduate uh, and had to kind of drop out, um, but I still loved science, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so sh long story short, right? I had great support networks in my life. Uh, I had a wonderful family that supported me and I had a wonderful group of friends from my local church at the time where I grew up that uh, always believed in me and like always really encouraged me to get back in school, stay in school, um, and, uh, go, yeah, go back to school. So that's basically what I did, right? I started, uh, I, I started working odd jobs <clears throat> to pay for, for community college in my local town. And I eventually took a geology class that I fell in love with, right? I fell in love with geology at that time. And towards the end of that community college career, I started work volunteering in the paleo lab as a preparator. And that's obviously how I got to that first moment where I went out to the field and I discovered that thingy and, um, started getting my experience that way. So uh, that was kind of a formative time. And so <clears throat> after community college, uh, I did my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree at App State, where I got my degree in geology. Uh, and I continued to dig up dinosaurs every summer. <clears throat> and, uh, and so eventually, after I graduated there, I, I came here to uh, NC State to uh, work on my master's in, in biology. And then I'm continuing here for my, uh, my PhD in uh, dinosaur paleontology. So, you know, it's been a winding path. That's a really simplified story, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to say <clears throat> by sharing this really is that, uh, that it, it can, it can man the path you take manifests in a number of ways, right? Um, and, uh, and I think for whoever's out there that might be listening that, you know, comes from a, a broken family or a troubled past <clears throat> that uh, don't underestimate your ability to reinvent yourself. And if you're not that person, but you know, people in your life who are, then uh, the best thing you can do is to just be a constant voice of support for that person and encouragement. And uh, it can really make a huge difference for somebody who wants to become a scientist. Uh, so. Yeah, there's more I could say about that, but uh, you know, in five minutes, I don't think we could cover all of them. So, so yeah. So if more if people want to talk to me or ask more questions about this, um, they can always reach out to me on social media. I'm always happy to answer more questions. So, uh, that's that's an amazing story, Aviv. Uh, thank you for sharing it with everybody. 
for sure. Because I mean, yeah, b- being around scientists uh, and people getting their PhDs or even just like looking at science Twitter sometimes, everybody who's gotten into science, very rarely do people come at it in a straight line. Yeah. Like researchers, professional people working in nonprofits, people working in government come to come to be in these positions through all kinds of twisting and turning paths. And I mean, it's not to overuse a word, but it's inspiring to, for, for you to be here and to share the story with everybody and to just to be that example that says, Hey, listen, I love science, always love science. And guess what? I found a way to make it work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) So I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, some more questions have popped up here and I don't want to leave these people hanging because they've actually got some good questions. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Is the dino fuzz known for and associated with these species or has it been interpreted based on related taxa? Um, it's, an, it's inferred based on related taxa. Yeah, so orodromians, we haven't found any orodromian with uh, with these features or these structures. But we know that there is a dinosaur called Kalindodromius, <clears throat> which is found in, I believe the Russian area uh, or maybe Mongolia, but I, I believe it's Russia, but uh, it was found with uh, structures that have been inferred as proto feathers. And there's another one called Tianyulong and another basal ornithischian called Satakosaurus, which has uh, primitive feather-like structures. Um, so it's still a kind of, uh, a uh, there's a, there's a frontier. It's a frontier that's uh, of science that we're, we're still learning a lot about it. But yeah, in orodromians, it's inferred. So, so that's kind of what my artwork was. Uh, you know, the the thing that you posted that I sent you that was kind of like a class project. Uh, it shouldn't be taken at, as like uh, accurate representation of what an orodromian looked like. I, I kind of went crazy with like uh, just having fun with it. But um, they probably were covered in some sort of downy feather like structure. Yeah. Okay, all right. And folks, you can see uh, Haviv's paleo artwork at naturalsciences.org. Look for the event page for tonight's. It's not that good. <laughs> it's it's but brilliant. They- it's awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this will be the this will be the last one, and then I want you to wrap things up for us by telling us about Cretaceous creatures uh, and the coolest dinosaur project coming to North Carolina in 2022. Totally. What is your favorite meme involving dinosaurs? Uh, oh my gosh. Oh gosh. Um, there's so many, right? I mean, I remember the, one of the first ones was the, was the Jurassic Park claw, right? It was like curious or something like her. I, I, I guess that was one of them. Oh, Velociraptor. Philo- yeah, that's right. Okay, that so was one <laughs> of them. That was, a, that was an OG one. So I, I think I liked that one because I think I actually used that one back in like 2013. Uh, right. But <laughs> I don't know what the new dinosaur memes are. So send them to me on, on Instagram or something. And uh, I guess keep me updated. So. <laughs> yeah, for real. And then, and then share them with me and, and we'll both be hip to the scene. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we'll try to catch up with the youths. For sure. <laughs> and their memes. So, okay, Javi, tell us, cause I know you're involved at the museum in the Dueling Dinosaurs Project and this new project that's going along with it, Crustaceous Creatures. Give us the, the 411. Yeah, okay, so obviously, I think most of you probably know about dueling dinosaurs by now. If you haven't, then then look into it. Just type in dueling dinosaurs. But, you know, we're getting those two uh, exceptional dinosaur specimens, the world's most complete tyrannosaur and a wonderful uh, triceratops. <clears throat> That's the dueling dinosaurs, uh, possibly engaged in a death battle with each other. And so these two dinosaurs are from an area on the earth called the Hell Creek Formation, which is basically like the last bastion of dinosaurs before they died from the Cretaceous impacts. Um, So what we're doing is we want to bring the dueling dinosaurs to the people, to to the public, right? We want them to have a stake in the actual science that gets done. And that's where Cretaceous Creatures comes in. So Cretaceous Creatures, what we did and what we've been doing for the past two years is going out (coughs) to this area of Montana where the dueling dinosaurs are from and we're collecting bags and bags of sediments from 
locations that have a bunch of microfossils. Microfossils are basically just the shells, scales, bones, and teeth of uh, many prehistoric creatures. And they range in size from a grain of sand to a quarter. And we collect bags of the sediment that these uh, microfossils are in. And then we bring them back to North Carolina and wash them, distill them down to the point where they're just, it's just a bag of, of like rocks and sand and fossils. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna send those fossils out to you, at, to, to middle school students, to middle school, to middle schools. And, um, and the hope is that there will be like a two day lesson plan where kids can sort through the sediment and pick out fossils, organizing them and helping us figure out what they are, categorizing them into the different species and the different animals that live back then and then sending them back to us. And their data will actually go directly towards uh, our ongoing research. So, um, so, you know, check out our website we have a few videos that have already been posted so far that really kind of explain more about what the project will be. We're about to launch another video that gets into more details pretty soon. But yeah, check out our website, check out our, uh, our social media and let teachers know about this, right? Uh, get it out there, send it to your teacher friends, especially those that are teaching middle schools, uh, middle school students, uh, get the word out there. So as soon as COVID is over and, and the world goes back to normal, hopefully we'll be launching, hopefully by 2021, so. Exciting stuff, really exciting stuff happening. Yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say it. I am I think it's a good thing that you're a part of it, Javi. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I'm, glad that, I'm glad that you're on the museum team for this one. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, everybody, you can see on the screen right now uh, how you can follow Javi's work, what he's got going on, Twitter and Instagram, Javiv Afrahami. Uh, and Cretaceous Creatures and CRET Creatures for those projects too. So, you know, if you go follow the museum stuff on social media around dueling dinosaurs, you'll probably get lots of glimpses at the work that Aviv is doing on that side of things too. Aviv, thanks so much for, for being on the show. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Everybody watching is going to turn this one off knowing 10 times more about these little cool dinosaurs than they knew before. That's all I could ask for. Everybody's got great Zoom cocktail party trivia for the next time they're hanging out with their friends and family. Right on. <laughs> Folks, I'll remind you, we'll be back here with another episode of Science Tonight live at seven o'clock next Thursday. Next week, we're going to be talking about crayfish species. And you're thinking, why are crayfish species interesting at all? And I'll tell you, it's because you're thinking crayfish, and maybe you're thinking like one little red or brown thing, but I'm going to tell you that they come in every color on the rainbow. And our scientist, Dr. Zach Lohman from West Liberty University, is out there trying to figure out just exactly how many different species of crayfish there are, and some are kind of hiding in plain sight. So we are going to do a deep dive on crayfish. Promise, you won't want to miss it. Uh, I've seen Zach speak before. It's going to be a great show. That's next Thursday at 7. In the meantime, check out naturalsciences.org for information on more live and pre-recorded virtual events that you can participate in. We've got a lot of cool stuff going, coming out of the museum right now and going on. And make sure that you're following the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There you'll see information about upcoming events as well as the latest in science that's coming out of the museum every single day of the week. Great stuff happening all around from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks everybody for tuning in to the program tonight. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you again real soon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>